such as shall best like yourself, ever considering out of what fight your enemy chargeth you. But be sure to keep your distance, so that neither head, arms, hands, body, nor legs be within his reach, but that he must first of necessity put in his foot or feet, at which time you have the choice of three actions by which you may endanger him and go free yourself. The first is to strike or thrust at him at that instant when he has gained you the place by his coming in. The second is to warg, and after to strike or thrust from that, remembering your governors. The third is to slip a little back and to strike or thrust after him. Uh, this from chapter 2 of George Silver's brief instructions on my paradoxes of defense. Welcome, fencers of the interwebs. Do you have a moment to talk about the true fight of George Silver? My name is Bill Kilmer. I fence at Worcester Historical Swordsmanship in Worcester, Massachusetts in the United States. And this is intended to be a continuing series of videos on the basic concepts of the fight of George Silver. This particular video was inspired by a Zoom training session done a few days ago by the principal instructor at Massachusetts Historical Swordsmanship, Dr. Ken Monshine. A uh, link will be in the description below. Ken has recently completed his translation of the, uh, from the French of L'Esprit de la Paix, pardon my French, uh, The Spirit of the Sword. And during this Zoom class, he was looking at some of the tactical concepts or tactical profiles discussed in this work. The part of his exposition of interest to us today is the question of who enters into distance and with what intention. And I'm going to attempt a little compare and contrast between Ken's description of uh, the uh, tactical profiles outlined in The Spirit of the Sword and Silver's discussion of entering into distance, which I read at the beginning of this episode. In laying this out, I am going to reference Stephen Hand's exposition of these concepts in his first instructional video on George Silver. Link once again in the description below. Though I do have one quibble uh, with Stephen Hand, which uh, I will touch upon. Uh, Stephen's video is an excellent resource. I encourage you to buy it. It's not very expensive, a real bargain, and I think it's still $20 U.S., now, in the Spirit of the Sword, there is a diagram. It lays out two profiles in which the fencer chooses to enter into distance. These would, in Silver's terminology, be profiles for the agent. And two in which the fencer permits the opponent to enter into distance, uh, which both would be uh, Silver's patient or patient agent, he uses those terms sort of interchangeably. The entering into distance profiles, or agent profiles, are the conqueror and the presser. Ken, if I understand him correctly, sees both these tactical profiles as inconsistent with Silver's preferred tactics. I would say that Ken is half right, roughly. In the conqueror profile, the attacker, or in Silver's terminology, once again, the agent, enters into distance in the third true time, uh, time of the hand, body, and foot, or in the fourth true time, time of hand, body, and feet. The threat, that is the hand, presumably uh, with a sword in it, uh, though I have seen people discuss this concept in relation to unarmed combat systems as well, the hand with the sword in it uh, enters into distance before, both in time and space, the target, which is everything else that is not the hand covered with the basket hilt and the blade of the sword. Hmm?
as it is a true time, and as such I in, understand it to be something that Silver considers to be a legitimate tactical choice. Though one fraught with certain perils, of which he outlines at length, and perhaps in a subsequent video I will discuss how this is done properly so as to mitigate the dangers of using the Conqueror tactical profile. The Presser, on the other hand, is not a tactical choice which Silver would generally approve. Generally, there are exceptions. But Silver would regard this in most circumstances as giving the patient a false time which invites them to hurt you, which, if they are competent, they will do and escape unhurt. Silver generally wants an explicit threat when entering into distance, one which the opponent must either negate or be hit. The presser's implicit threat, made simply by pressing into distance, is, from the point of view of the patient, candy. It is jam. Because at the moment of putting in his foot, that is of entering into distance, the presser will be vulnerable somewhere. Always. Silver says this, and this I believe. The problem for the patient is to recognize immediately when distance has been broken, see the vulnerability, strike into it, and immediately fly out of distance. Not reacting immediately and then flying out immediately creates an unacceptably high possibility of a double hit. And I do believe from Silver's point of view it is far, far better to miss the opportunity than for the patient to risk the double. The patient may take solace in the fact that having done it once and not been hit, the presser will do it again and this time the patient will be better prepared. So, let us come to Silver's preferred tactical choices. What the Spirit of the Sword names the blinder or the counterer, uh, Stephen Hand calls before, just, and after. The before facing oppressor we have just covered, that is, the agent who deliberately enters into distance in a false time, failing to present an immediate threat, the patient strikes the oppressor before they have begun an attack, because the patient can. Uh, the other before uh, is the case of the imperfect conqueror. An agent attempts to attack in the third or fourth true time, that is to say time of the hand, body, and foot, or time of the hand, body, and feet, but does so imperfectly in an inadvertent false time, offering an unintended target. Uh, usually what happens is that the basket is not completely covering the sword arm when distance is broken. The patient strikes and flies out to reestablish distance. Facing a conqueror who properly attacks in a true time before is not an option. But the patient does have two remaining choices. The first, as I understand Silver, is to parry and repost, then fly out of distance. When the parry, or in Silver's terminology, the ward, occurs, it is with a true cross, where the blades are perpendicular or nearly so. The defender is then sure that the attack has been defeated and proceeds with their repost having unambiguously negated the opponent's potential to continue the attack. Being in the place is a terminology or concept that you run into quite a bit in silver. The place is where you can strike but cannot be struck. It is a moment. That moment will pass. The opponent will recover their offensive potential as quickly as they may. Which is why Silver says over and over and over, strike and fly out, strike and fly out, minding your governors. The governors we are going to have to unpack in another video, 
because this one is already getting to be longer than I planned. But here is where I diverge from Stephen Hand a trifle. Stephen speaks of first, which is proper to the agent, and then uh, of before, just, and after as being proper to the patient. But textually, I do not see the idea of just as fundamental to silver. The exception, not the rule, is how I would describe it. Uh, Stephen speaks of the patient striking the agent just at the moment when the agent expected their attack to connect. But that is not what I see Silver saying in his fundamental breakdown of the patient's opportunities in Chapter 2. Rather, where Stephen puts just, Silver puts parry, repost, ward, and strike. There are a couple of one-time counters in Silver which could be described justly as just but I don't see it as fundamental to Silver's understanding of the tactical architecture of the fight. They are ornaments only, a, a cornice, not a cornerstone. It's perfectly possible to fight Silver's true fight without using any one-time counters at all. They require considerable practice, and you can work around them until you master them. With the after, now, that I see as being really part of Silver's architecture. The patient there slips back far enough to void the agent's attack. And then, when the agent's attack is spent, strikes or thrusts and flies out. Now, Spent is a part of Silver's concept of how an attack works. Before the attack is begun, the sword is bent. That is to say, bent like a bow, with potential energy ready to be unleashed. At the point at which the attack would strike the opponent, it is spent. Having expended its energy, it is lying spent. Then it is drawing back in some manner or other to recover potential energy for the next strike. Uh, that's the, roughly Silver's attitude on this. Uh, I think, once again, Stephen Hand does a better job of running it through in his uh, videotape, but I want to give you at least a sketch. So, what I want to lift up to you here is that of the three actions by which Silver has the patient endangering the agent, two of the three are based on avoiding the agent's attack rather than warding it. This is something which people who are not accustomed to fencing people who use Silver's system find disconcerting. The Taylor Angelo Roworth lineage certainly has within it slips of the hand, slips of the leg, uh, slips of the whole body. They're in the system, but they are not seen by anybody that I see discussing it or working it as foundational to the tactics. Most of the time, people who work within these systems work linearly and within the parry repost frame. And within these systems, a great deal of effort is expended upon perfecting the lunge and perfecting feints and actions on the blade uh, to open the line of attack. For the silver practitioner, on the other hand, uh, these are tactically legitimate, they exist within the system, but for the silver practitioner, the slip, the void, the traverse, uh, which silver sometimes calls gathering, are more fundamental, as are certain lines, that is to say, engaging guards, because they deny the opponent the opportunity 
to make actions upon the blade because the blade is held out of the opponent's reach. So, Silver offers what I would describe as a wider tactical repertoire and a different tactical architecture than the later broadsword and saber systems. And fully half of that architecture is based on the void. Maybe more. Sounds rather mystical and oriental, doesn't it? But it really is quite practical. It, at least so it seems to me. So, this brings us to the end of this discussion. I hope you have enjoyed it. My intention is that in our next video we will begin to unpack the governors and to do that in the context of the fights. Uh, so, if you have enjoyed this and found it engaging, uh, please like and subscribe. And we will look forward to seeing you next time. Have a good evening. This is the usual disclaimer. I have said elsewhere, I am not an expert. I am a student. And I have drawn heavily on the works of others to inform my understanding. First of all, of course, upon the works of George Silver himself, but also on the works of many instructors and scholars. And if I have drawn upon your work and you feel that I have misrepresented you, slighted you, misattributed you, or in any other way offended, please accept my apologies, let me know, and let me fix it uh, as we go forward. Uh, you have been absolutely instrumental in improving my understanding of George Silver's true fight. Any errors or omissions are, of course, entirely my own. Thank you. See you on the flip side.